Hello, it's a pleasure to be here with you virtually today. My name is Jeffrey Geske, and I am a cardiologist with background training in multimodality imaging and a clinical focus on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And today I'll be discussing with you the new ACCHA 2020 hypertrophic cardiomyopathy guidelines with a specific question of what's new for the imager. Here are the disclosures for this talk. I have one relationship with industry, but it shouldn't impact this talk. It's also worth disclosing that I have a bit of a quirky sense of humor. Our learning objective for this talk is to recognize changes in the ACC AHA 2020 hypertrophic cardiomyopathy guidelines that affect assessment by imaging. And to do that, we're really going to look at four aspects of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy care that have changed with regards to imaging in the 2020 AHA ACC guidelines. We'll look at diagnosis of HCM, sudden cardiac death risk stratification, monitoring of patients with known HCM, and also one discussion regarding a therapy change for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Before we dive into those changes though, it's worth noting that the overall impact on imaging and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is small. But I do think there are a few important things to highlight that have changed in these guidelines. With regards to diagnosis of HCM, for adult patients, there's really no change. However, for children, there has been a change. For diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in pediatric patients, we've previously or historically utilized a Z-score for wall thickness. This is a BSA-adjusted measurement with a cutoff of two standard deviations above the mean being considered uh, diagnostic for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. However, if you compare this to what we use for adults, this is a significantly lower threshold for making the diagnosis in children. That 15 millimeter cutoff that we use for adults, that's a z-score of about six. So you see that we're using a much lower threshold in children. The new guidelines kind of seek to rectify that difference a bit. And they say that in a child with no symptoms, no family history, no known pathogenic genetic mutation, that a z-score of greater than 2.5 should be used instead of two. But it's still okay to use that z-score of two if there's a known family history or a known pathogenic HCM mutation. Let's next talk about sudden cardiac death risk stratification for HCM. And how you approach that really depends on which guideline you look at, because there's both a US, the ACC AHA guideline, as well as an ESC guideline. And there are some notable differences between these two. Let's take a look at the US 2020 guideline to start. The first part of the 2020 ACCHA sudden cardiac death risk stratification decision-making tree is that if you've died before, you deserve a defibrillator. You don't really need a doctorate for that one, but a resuscitated cardiac death or an objective sustained VT or VF event is a reason to implant a defibrillator. Without such an event, we then look at five different criteria. The first of which is a family history of sudden cardiac deaths. This would be in a first degree relative, a parent, sibling, or child. And a sudden cardiac death event in one of those individuals would correspond to risk in the patient themselves. Massive left ventricular hypertrophy is defined as a wall thickness greater than 30 millimeters. Unexplained syncope is concerning. This is really looking at an arrhythmogenic syncope, so it requires careful history taking. Not any syncope will meet this qualification. So someone that gets a syncopal episode at their blood draw, that's really not gonna count. Apical aneurysm or presence of a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 50%. If any of those criteria are present, then an ICD is reasonable. If none of those criteria are present, then we look at non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on ambulatory monitoring or on exercise treadmill testing. And if that is present in children, an ICD is reasonable. If not in adults, it may be considered. We're down into class 2B recommendations at that point. If non-sustained ventricular tachycardia is not present, then we can look at extensive late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI. 
If that's present, it could also drive us into an ICD may be considered a 2B recommendation. Absent all of these criteria, then an ICD is not indicated. If we compare this to the European guidelines, we can see that those are different. They use this calculator approach. And the, the components of the European calculator are age, maximal wall thickness as a continual variable, left atrial size, this is LA dimension on echocardiography, maximum left ventricular outflow tract gradient, a family history of sudden death, non-sustained VT or unexplained syncope. Put, plug in those numbers and it spits back at you an estimated five-year sudden cardiac death risk. Now, there are times when these are concordant, but you can see there are certainly differences between them. The European calculator includes age, LA size, LVOT gradient. They both include wall thickness, but one uses a cutoff of 30 millimeters, the other uses a continuous variable. And now the ACCHA guidelines include extensive late gadolinium enhancement. If we look at how the guidelines have changed in the ACC AHA guidelines compared to the prior, we can see that this first box here has gone from three to five. So presence of apical aneurysm and left ventricular systolic dysfunction, those two are new in this current guideline as far as these big indications where an ICD is reasonable. The other major change is inclusion of late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI into this decision-making tree. Note this was not present in the European calculator, but is present in the ACC AHA guideline. So let's go through each of those three major things that have changed in order. Apical aneurysm, left ventricular systolic dysfunction, and extensive late gadolinium enhancement. With regards to apical aneurysm, the guideline definition is a discrete thin-walled dyskinetic or akinetic segment the most distal portion of the LV chamber, independent of size. And these thin-walled aspects of the apex can be not only an itis for ventricular arrhythmia formation, but as shown nicely on this two-chamber still frame from a cardiac MRI, can be a focus for development of apical thrombosis. And sometimes they can be a little bit subtle. Uh, here's an example. This is a four-chamber steady state free procession cardiac MR sequence. Uh, showing a small apical aneurysm right out at the tip there. And this is actually one that was missed on transthoracic echocardiogram. So it can be very challenging to see these at times. And it's interesting that the guideline uh, defines these independent of size as contributing to sudden cardiac death risk. Here's an example of an apical aneurysm on a contrast transthoracic echocardiogram. This is a two-chamber view zoomed in on the LV apex. Uh, this example, not subtle, uh, large aneurysm with dyskinetic walls. Uh, we see similarly a, a comparable image here on the cardiac CT of a large apical aneurysm with thin walls. And this patient actually went to surgical apical aneurysmectomy. Here we see an image from that surgery. The surgeons have opened up the LV apex and are peering into the LV cavity here and will then end up suturing shut the LV apex. Here's a panel of images from a classic paper by Dr. Barry Marin in circulation in 2008, just showing all the different shapes and sizes that LV apical aneurysms can take on. And I think it's important to keep that in mind as you're approaching interpretation of images looking for apical aneurysm. Left ventricular systolic dysfunction was one of the new additions to the uh, sudden cardiac death decision-making process. And we will oftentimes refer to this as a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy beginning to burn out, where their LV transitions from this hyperdynamic, vigorous left ventricular contractile function to more and more progressive left ventricular systolic dysfunction. And the other day when I was in clinic, I had this fantastic example of burnout. Oh wait, uh, oh sorry, that's that's just me in clinic. Um, uh, how do, where's the delete or unrecord on this thing? Um, I did warn you about the humor in advance. So um, burnout uh, is again, left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Remember the LV should be hyperdynamic. So even an LVEF of 50% should really kind of raise suspicions. Uh, 
Uh, this is a patient that I have who is MYBPC3 gene positive for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When I first met him in 2016, his uh, left ventricular systolic function was rather borderline at 50%. And we kept close eye on this, but despite optimal medical therapy now in 2020, his EF has progressed down to 15% and he's undergoing transplant evaluation. Uh, so this is a patient that we'd also consider at increased risk for sudden cardiac death once his LVEF falls below 50%. Late gadolinium enhancement continues to grow in importance with regards to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinical management. And really, late gadolinium enhancement gives us a window into myocardial substrate to understand the degree of fibrosis burden. And the greater the fibrosis, the greater the arrhythmogenic potential because this fibrosis serves as a nidus for ventricular arrhythmias. There's really two schools of thought regarding quantitation of delayed enhancement. One is that you can quantitate it and quantitation matters. The other is that it matters, but you can't quantitate it because there's, there's just too much going on and it's difficult to quantitate that that amount. And the guidelines have really had to arbitrate between these two. And the way they've done that is they've said that diffuse and extensive late gadolinium enhancement, either quantified comprising greater than 15% of LV mass or estimated by visual inspection is important. Here's an example of a patient of mine that has extensive, diffuse, very severe late gadolinium enhancement. So this is a short axis late gadolinium enhancement series. You'll see we're starting here at the LV base, right as it goes into the outflow tract. And at this level, the degree of late gadolinium enhancement is underwhelming. But as we progress towards the LV apex, you can see that there is more and more and more late get on enhancement, such that this quantitates as much greater than 15% of LV myocardial mass. And this degree of late get on enhancement was so much that I actually wondered, could we be looking at some alternative process than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So I went on to actually biopsy this patient and indeed their biopsy results were consistent with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a large scar burden. This patient ended up going on to ICD implantation with the late gum enhancement burden being a large part of sudden cardiac death risk decision-making. We'll next transition to monitoring and what the new guidelines say regarding imaging for monitoring of patients with known HCM. And there's no change with regards to echocardiographic evaluation. A repeat echo is re recommended every one to two years to assess the left ventricular hypertrophy, dynamic outflow tract obstruction, mitral regurgitation, and myocardial function. However, now the guidelines also recommend serial imaging from a cardiac MRI standpoint. So the guidelines say it's, it's reasonable to consider a cardiac MRI every three to five years. So don't be surprised if you begin to see more and more cardiac MRIs done on established HCM patients to help with sudden cardiac death risk stratification. Lastly, we'll talk about therapy. Here's a patient of mine with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I've included a four chamber apical transthoracic echocardiogram and a long axis steady state free possession cardiac MRI. And the question for this symptomatic patient is, would myectomy be helpful? The patient has NYJ class three symptoms despite medical therapy and despite extensive evaluation has not been found to have any significant outflow tract obstruction or mid ventricular obstruction. Uh, there's actually barely a mid ventricular cavity present. This patient would not benefit from a traditional myectomy, but would actually benefit from a transapical myectomy. So this is where they go in through the LV apex, much like we saw with that apical aneurysmectomy, and then they roto-rooter out the myocardium, debulking the inside of the left ventricle in order to increase left ventricular cavity size. 
This can be combined with transaortic myectomy, so you can go from below through the apex and from above through the aortic valve to remove myocardium. But really requires an experienced surgeon, uh, and the guidelines are very clear that this only needs to be done at high volume comprehensive centers like the Mayo Clinic. Which patients qualify for a transapical myectomy? These are patients with apical HCM with severe symptoms, NYHA class three or four despite medical therapy, who have a preserved LVEF, so greater than 50%, a small LV cavity size, and a low LV stroke volume. The procedure is done to improve or augment LV chamber size and increase LV stroke volume. So recognizing the importance of quality volumetric assessment in identifying these patients is critical. We've gone through and looked at changes from the 2020 ACCHA guideline with regards to diagnosis, sudden cardiac death risk stratification, monitoring and therapies. We've learned a few different ways that the guidelines have changed. Not a lot of major changes. Many things have stayed the same, but I hope that this talk has been helpful in guiding your, Im guiding your imaging practice. Thank you very much.